of transportation is undoubtedly in the midst of disruption, as it faces unprecedented challenges on multiple fronts. Today's transport and energy challenges require a holistic approach, better urban planning, reduction and optimization of our mobility needs, digitization, new business models, shared economy, behavioral changes and electrification. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, disruptive technologies are transforming mobility, but the sector absolutely still needs to move faster to reduce its carbon footprint. And because of the interlinkage with energy, it will take a joined up, holistic approach to do so. How do we build comprehensive, systemic solutions that deliver better, cleaner, and more socially just transport for all? That is our key question in this session. And in just a minute, I want to introduce our esteemed panelists. But first, I want to uh, ask all of those who are registered users to please vote uh, or to please weigh in on our audience question for this session. And that question is, in your opinion, should the polluter pays and user pays principles be implemented without delay in all modes of transport? And I see that some of you are already voting, but let's get more votes on this as well. Should the polluter pays and user pays principles be implemented without delay in all modes of transport? Please vote yes or no, and we'll take a look at the results in just a few moments. But first of all, it is my pleasure now to introduce our esteemed guests. And I welcome Maika Yip. She is director of the Institute of Transport Research at the German Aerospace Center, currently on leave from her teaching position as professor for transport demand and transport impacts at the Technical University of Berlin. Welcome to you. I'm also very pleased to be joined by Corinna Apachite. She is head of artificial intelligence and big data solutions at Continental Automotive. I hope I more or less pronounced your last name correctly, Corinna. Uh, and uh, if not, please do correct me. And also a very warm welcome to Joanna Kuba. She is Senior Director of Public Policy at Uber, based in the Netherlands with responsibility for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And dear ladies, and once again, we have an all-female uh, session, uh, which, is, uh, which is always exciting. Let me first go back to that audience poll to take one quick look at where the results stand before I come to you. And in fact, by far and away, most of our registered users did vote yes that both the polluter pays and user pays principle should be implemented without delay, just 8% saying no. So, and by the way, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am very much hoping that you can also send us your audience questions. We had a little bit of a problem with the technology for audience questions earlier on, but I'm hoping we fixed it. So dear audience members, please do send us questions uh, and we will try to bring them on in a little bit later on. And now let me go back to the title question of this session and ask each of you to tell us a little bit about what you, what your organization are currently doing to deliver better, cleaner, and fairer transport for all, and how you see the key priorities for doing that. And as always, I'm going to ask you to please keep your remarks brief because we have a very limited window of time for this session. So I'm talking about responses of under three minutes, uh, if you would, please. And I'll begin with Micah Yip. Thank you very much um, for the invitation and for um, the chance to have that discussion with you here in this virtual conference. Um, from my perspective, the most crucial answer to your question is the holistic approach that you already mentioned in the video that you presented. Um, and that's actually what we are pursuing in our institute. So we are analyzing the solutions that we have at hand and we look at the effects of these solutions in a pretty broad picture. So we analyze the humans, we check whether they want to use that technology, for example, we check whether the infrastructure fits to these solutions, um, whether the business models fit, whether they exist. And we also look into the rebound effects. Often we see positive effects of solutions, but only in a very limited way. 
And they also cause rebound effects, which are negative in the long run. So what we are trying to do with our research, identify these holistic effects, and then, of course, also provide solutions to them. For example, when you look into the automated trucks, which can drive in the windshield of other trucks, they have, of course, uh, the, the idea of saving energy. But um, if they are actually more cost efficient, it also increases the number of trucks that are driven that way. And that's exactly one of these rebound effects. So we can actually implement climate neutral mobility for all, but we have to implement our, our solutions in a systematic way and think of all the effects and implement a whole package of solutions. And then we manage that transformation. Thank you very much. And let me go over to uh, Corinna Abishite now. And would you please correct my, uh, my pronunciation uh, if necessary and tell us what Continental is doing in this area and uh, also what you're doing in your particular area of AI and big data. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being today with you. Uh, my name is uh, a Romanian one, Corina Apachite would be the, the correct pronunciation, but since I am doing uh, all, all the day mistakes in German and English in pronunciation, everything is fine. Um, so electric mobility in its diverse forms is and will be an important component of future mobility. Uh, that is why specialists around the world are working on, uh, on the further development of existing concepts and new solutions for climate-friendly hybrid and electrical vehicles. Uh, in order to create safe, efficient work and comfortable mobility, we need to combine comp competencies from integration towards energy optimization, drive management, vehicle safety, information management, and tires. Uh, I do believe that data and artificial intelligence, which are my area of responsibilities, will contribute to both intelligent and sustainable transportation and electrification as well. Uh, how can be that? Uh, data, data, if put together, enables us to have an unprecedented holistic view on mobility, to treat it from different perspectives, and to consider all dependencies and cause effects therein. Automotive industry has a very complex uh, supply chain um, and uh, it's only one part of the mobility we are uh, envisioning for the future. Uh, very often, if we try to optimize parts of a system, some others will be disadvantaged. Uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence contribute already to predictive and optimized mobility solutions. Imagine that you, you could predict how many people are willing to move from A to B at any time. We would then plan a car or a bus of exactly that size to pick them up at the known location. We reduce uh, the emissions and um, we, uh, we plan the, the correct uh, car size to, to accomplish the task. We avoid oversized solution and we meet exactly the customer needs. Yes, we are facing new challenges, but we are getting also new technologies at hand, like big data, like AI, to master them. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting indeed. And let me go now to uh, Joanna or Joanne uh, Kuba to talk about what Uber is doing here and, uh, and how you uh, are contributing to those three different uh, very important uh, goals that our title mentions. Thank you so much, and, and really happy to be here. Um, so over the time, over our time in Europe, uh, we've worked really hard to find positive and sustainable ways to work and partner with cities across Europe, um, and also in Germany. And we've learned a lot along the way. Um, we believe that in partnership with public transit and cities, we can create a mobility ecosystem where private car ownership becomes dispensable. Now, the real question will center around how mobility players will offer the best and most sustainable services for consumers. Um, some of you might have already heard um, and that we're really proud that we made a global sustainability commitment last year that was actually led out of Europe, where we're going to see that Uber will be carbon neutral in Europe in 2030, um, switching to become 50% electric rides on our platform by the end of 2025. Um, we're also committing uh, 800 million uh, in resources to drivers um, to support switching to electric vehicles. But um, we can't do this alone. Um, we have to be able to partner with policymakers and the EV 
the industry to really create the conditions that help us to further tackle things like um, appropriate, uh, the lack of appropriate charging uh, infrastructure, the lack of affordable and secondhand electric vehicles. Um, there's currently insufficient financial incentives to close the interim cost gap. But also, we need to make sure that there's enabling policies that facilitate EV transition for drivers, specifically in our case. For example, subsidies on secondhand electric vehicles or emission-based uh, road charging that is applied to emitting vehicles. Um, but also, we need to make sure that we're tackling outdated national regulations um, that cause inefficiencies and prevent drivers from electrifying um, by making it worse off for them. For example, um, we have rules like return to garage, which you see in places like Germany or um, in Italy, which can lead to actually a higher and even sometimes double the amount of kilometers driven, half of which is without a passenger. Now, if you think about it for electric vehicles, that actually means twice more charging needed because the vehicle is running empty. Um, so, so we see a lot of opportunity. And I think that there's a lot that um, Europe in particular and the cities around um, the, the, the space are really tackling. Um, and I, we want to be a partner to, to many of the, the thinkers that are that are leading the space. I want to come back to electrification in just a moment because clearly that is one of the main uh, nexus uh, spaces where energy and transport will converge going forward. But let me first ask a little bit more, and I think this one goes to, I would say, to Micah Yip, uh, also with your overview of policy and planning. Our audience question, user pays and polluter pays, uh, a, slightly naive observer might say, why is that not already happening? Um, so what exactly, what obstacles have to be overcome to ensure that that does happen and that we do uh, bring in externalities and uh, help assign responsibility for them? And what difference would it make? Um, I was actually smiling when I saw the answer to your questions from, from the audience. The reason for that is that, at least according to our experience, um, that the policy power does not work if we actually increase the taxes to, to cause the environment-friendly behavior that we wanted to observe. Because typically, in our models, it hardly changes the model split. So we cannot convince humans to use, for example, an environment-friendly way of transport um, by raising the taxes for environmentally unfriendly behavior. That's a totally different point of view with regard to the energy framework, but in the mobility framework, it hardly works for, for the whole population. There might be differences, of course, from one human to the next, from one individual to, ne to the next, but in the, in the broad majority, we don't observe a positive effect of such punishments. And as a psychologist, I have to tell you that there is also another point of view. It's also a matter of rewarding the right behavior and not only punishing the wrong behavior. So you should actually think of combining two different types of solutions. Hmm. Very, very interesting indeed. Thank you for that. Um, then let me drill a little bit deeper now on electrification. And uh, as I mentioned, that is where the interlinkage becomes very, very clear. Um, Joanna Kuba mentioned a couple of the obstacles uh, or the areas where there needs to be improvement, but I'd like to ask all of you to weigh in on this, uh, and also on where you see the limits to electrification in the mobility sector, which in some ways goes to the question also of uh, the role of green gas and uh, green hydrogen, whether you think that this is going to become a major contender in, uh, in transport. So let me perhaps start with, uh, with uh, Karina Apashita and then uh, get a take from the others as well. Yeah. So the electrification in mobility takes um, you know, the, all of us to, um, to succeed you know, towards this development. It's not only about um, um, mobility providers, suppliers in, in the area, but also the, um, the end, end user, the people using these vehicles, the legislation and so on. We all have to, uh, to grow with this challenge and provide uh, solutions, use these solutions in our all day life. Uh, and that's why um, maybe it takes more time that we would like to 
uh, to have it. So this is one uh, one accept uh, one aspect which you have to accept. It takes uh, it needs all of us to to succeed with this um, uh, with this endeavor with uh, with this common goal which we have. Um, electrification is about um, infrastructure as well. So we need to um, to have the possibility to recharge the electrical vehicles. Uh, it's about um, something which has to reach the the mass. So everybody has to to have the possibility to um, uh, to own such a vehicle, to use it by um, by any means, to to rent it and so on. So uh, it's um, it's a challenge with uh, various facets, with various aspects, and all of them have to to reach a certain maturity level, has to to reach a certain penetration grade, such that we we can say yes, we we did it, yes, we managed um, uh, to to evolve towards this um, common goal. And uh, what is also important is to to let uh, certain technology freedom. So yes, um, environmental goals are important, and uh, we we do everything to to reach them, to fulfill them. But uh, what is necessary is to have the, the technological freedom. It's uh, up to every player in this um, in this um, arena to to develop and use uh, the. Um, uh, corresponding technology, which meets then the, the um, uh, CO2 goals, for example. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a follow-up question that's come in from the audience. And uh, mm -hmm. in some ways, it plays off the last uh, point that you made. Uh, the, the premise of this question is the following. E-mobility requires synergies between car manufacturers, charging points, and e-networks and adequate regulations for supporting all three. At the same time, you've just talked about technological freedom. I'm putting that part in. So how do we balance those two aspects and uh, how best to confront this, asks the audience member. Um, I, I'm very much biased by artificial intelligence and uh, data, usage of data. And um, if, uh, if we start to... Um, Oh, to regulate these uh, these areas too early, uh, then uh, it might be that a, a lot of experimentation, a lot of developments are, are prohibited. Uh, so we have to to take care, to be very careful uh, in which sequ sequence do uh, do we do what. Uh, too early regulation of something which is, does not exist yet uh, would be pro prohibiting and eliminate certain solutions which cannot be developed anymore. Thank you so common much. targets, yes, but uh, then uh, we, we need a technological freedom to, to reach those goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Ioana Kuba, uh, your thoughts, uh, additional thoughts on electrification uh, and how to meet the challenges. Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely would go back to a lot of the, the points I was saying earlier, which is that it is going to be really critical for us to find those three elements come together at the same time. Um, I think it's absolutely right that we have to have the technological freedom to be able to really show progress and, and move the needle in terms of what um, the dynamics of society are really looking for. But equally, if we want to make big shifts for people to actually make the right choices, then we have to create um, accessibility so making sure, for example, when it comes to lack of charging infrastructure, that those aren't just built in uh, or placed in areas that are high traffic, but actually placed maybe in neighborhoods in which uh, people that would use them not just for personal use, but for actual work. So drivers who were in communities where they live so they can charge and then, and then uh, be part of the contribution of making sure that when they're on the road um, earning on a platform, they're actually also using an electric vehicle. Affordability. Um, and so... I see that those things go hand in hand, that they go very much in line with um, the, the governmental regulations that are being put in place, um, as well as private sector, as well as creating the regulatory environment to allow and foster these things. So I think that absolutely you have to create the right freedoms, but I, I think that they can't be done separately. All these things have to come together at the same time. 
And uh, Michael Yip, um, speak to the general question also if, if you like, but I have a couple of audience questions in addition that have come in. Um, also that one about e-mobility requiring synergies between manufacturers, uh, charging points, and e-networks. And maybe I'll wait till you've answered that and then pose the other two because they take us a bit away from electrification. Um, what I would look, like to do in my answer is to emphasize the human aspect in that context. Um, you know, at the end of the day, humans make decisions about how they are mobile, about how they want to be mobile. Um, humans are typically used to routine. So they use, for example, their own car because they've used it the past weeks, months, and years. So if you want to change this behavior, you have to create an incentive and you have to ensure that the humans have the right mental models about that change. If you're convinced that the electric car will not bring you to your destination, it's very unlikely that you'll actually use it. And it's actually quite rarely that humans really check whether their mental models are correct. They just believe that it won't work and then they don't use it. So what we have to do, we have to ensure that humans have the right mental models and that they see the options that are actually out there on our streets and that are currently under development um, and convince them that it's actually a good idea to use it. And for that purpose, it's also made about the infrastructure. If you're convinced that you have no chance to refuel your electric car, it's not very likely that, that you're going to use it or buy one. Mm. Yeah, and that also, of course, gets back to Johanna Kuba's point that if you make it easy for people, if you put it in the logical, easy place where they would expect to find it or would be glad to find it, then obviously you maybe have some chance to influence their behavior. Let me ask you a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, the, one of them, getting back to your point about taxing and offering incentives. And uh, this question is, Professor Yip, taxing polluters without offering opportunities for an alternative is a barrier. Um, and clearly that could be said even if you're offering incentive, incentives. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to have the options. That's right. That's what I was actually assuming. Um, I saw one study which I actually liked where there was a new infrastructure developed for bike users. The problem was that nobody was using it. So the people still used their car to drive, for example, to the center of the city. And they were simply ignoring these, uh, this bike infrastructure. And um, in that city, there was an app developed which recognized automatically whether or not the users drove by a car or used their bike. And um, when they exhibited the right behavior, used their bike, they collected points. And after they gained a certain amount of points, they received a reward that was at the beginning a cup of coffee, very simple reward. And after some time, they received a prize for being a very environmental friendly bike user. And that actually increased the usage of the spike infrastructure. And that's a very easy way of rewarding the right behavior. And it, it worked pretty well. And it's easy to implement. It's not that difficult. And let me put one more audience question to you that is also a planning question, but the others are also invited to weigh in on it if they wish, because it, it partly goes back to what we were discussing in our Livable Cities panel, actually, uh, a while ago uh, this afternoon. Um, how we get coherence between city-based infrastructure and planning and national schemes. So this audience question reads, how to move toward intelligent mobility when most countries invest more in infrastructure for traditional mobility than in things like sidewalks and bike lanes. Now, sidewalks and bike lanes often are city decisions, whereas national policymakers are working in a different framework. Um, first of all, to you, Mikey, how do we get that better joined up than it is at the moment? Well, from my perspective, the best way is to, to show the good examples. Um, to look into the world and see which, which solution was implemented in which city, how did it work, uh, was the city successful, and is that solution transferable to my city, to my state? And if you 
reach the right persons. That's of course a critical point. Um, you have a chance to also change the national schemes. It's a challenge, of course. It also takes time. But my experience is if you have the, the good examples and if people see how these examples will also solve their solutions, there's a chance. But as I said, it takes time. Another audience question that came in, uh, in a way, uh, speaks to the same point, and it's about the complexity of the decarbonization challenge in the transport area. So maybe I can uh, put this uh, to you, uh, Johanna Kuba, because it links up uh, also. Who are the main people you're talking to? Is it at city level? Is it national? Is it both? And in some ways, do you find yourself becoming a vector for transferring best practices? Uh, is there some degree to which you can uh, suggest, well, look, you know, we've seen this interesting solution being used here. Uh, think about it. Absolutely. Um, we work both um, city level and actually at national level, but also um, even at the EU level. And so I think that it's really important that we actually don't silo ourselves into one conversation. Um, it's actually why one of the big reasons I love working at a company like Uber, because the impact that you can have in the conversation is so varied um, and dynamic, because um, as was just said, it's really important for us to understand how cities are moving. Different cities move in different ways. Um, and it's really critical that we're able to understand and work with cities and national governments to implement city practical level um, solutions that make sense for the dynamics of that city, but also really take laser up and understand what you think of from a strategic level. In terms of us being a vector, I, I think that's, that's super spot on. Um, you know, there's a lot we can learn from one another um, around the world. And I think one of the benefits of being a large um, global player is that we're able to see examples that come through from different places. So for example, um, early on in Dallas, we had done a big transit partnership there where we were able to work with the DART uh, system to be able to actually um, give users the choice to maybe Uber to a the closest public transport spot and then from there be able to take a transit solution. Being able to use technology to incentivize people to, to move around in a more sustainable way um, is actually something that I think we can do hand in hand and learn from different cities around the world. We've also taken a lot of learnings from what we've done in one city in Europe and, and transplanted that across um, to others. Um, and then also in terms of data and how to understand that data and urban planning data is something that we really want to work with um, cities on. So absolutely, I think these conversations are dynamic um, at every level and, and very multifaceted. Thank you very much. And uh, last question goes to you, uh, Corinna uh, Afeshit, uh, with the request for a um, somewhat uh, brief answer. Um, that complex CO2 challenge, of course, means for a company like Conti, really in many ways transforming its own business model. So let me ask you um, kind of a two-part question. In general, how do you think that business model will look, say, 10, 15, 20 years from now? And secondly, innovative solutions within the company um, how do you test them and scale them up? Because I, uh, I had a very interesting conversation uh, back at the end of last year with none other than Elon Musk in regard to the big battery factory that he's building here uh, outside of Berlin. And he said the single greatest challenge they face is scaling up pilot ideas, innovative new ideas. So last question would go to you about uh, those two aspects, transformation of the business model in general, and then testing and scaling up innovative new possibilities. So related to the first part of the question, business models, innovative business models, they will be much more agile, derived from customer needs and not from um, in engineering um, ingeniosity, which was previously enough to, um, to be successful. Related to the second part of the question, I agree, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to, to overcome this threshold from a prototype to uh, something for ma uh, mass consumption for everybody. Um, we, we have different stages within Continental. We, um, 
we try something within the EI department, which I am leading. Then we are transferring um, in, in a bigger com community within Continental. We have different partners also with um, universities, with public um, authorities. And um, this is how we extend the, um, the radius of a new of an innovative product. Um, and so doing step by step, we hope to, to bring the right innovations on, on, on the road, on the street, and to contribute to um, a safer, um, cleaner, and a more comfortable and intelligent uh, transportation of tomorrow. Mike, yep, I saw you nodding so emphatically when I mentioned scaling up that I think I'll just uh, go to you for one last, last word on that point. I think it's, it's a crucial issue, scaling up. And um, from my perspective, the most important point here is um, that we actually go into the real world at an early stage of the development of the systems check whether our ideas about these solutions are actually valid. How do people react on these solutions? And think of what could actually ruin my idea and establish an idea that's so good that nobody can actually say something about it. And if we then, in addition to that, manage to have real-world laboratories in a, in a representative setting, use different cities, use, for example, also a suburban space, and confront the real world with these ideas. And um, if it survives, if that idea survives there, I'm sure we'll also manage with the scaling up. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to all three of you ladies for um, this very insightful exchange. I appreciate very much that you could join us uh, for this discussion and wish you all the best. Mm -hmm.